All right, it looks like our audio is good, so as soon as we get connected with the streaming, we'll start. Okay. All right, it looks like we're connected. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the 930 breakout session of the Open Simulator Community Conference 2013. As a reminder to our in-world and web audiences, you can view the full conference schedule on our website at conference.opensimulator.org, and you can post your questions in local chat, on the Ustream chat, or tweet your comments using hashtag OSCC13. This hour, we're happy to introduce Ramesh Ramalol who will be presenting virtual exercise design in immersive virtual learning environments, recent emerging approaches. Ramesh Ramlo uh, has been developing immersive virtual learning environments for diverse user groups during the past seven years on platforms that include Second Life and OpenSim. He is currently the CEO and T uh, CTO of Deep Sim Deep Semaphore LLC, an e-learning and simulation solutions company. Welcome, Ramesh. Hi, um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, so just let me know that you can actually hear me. Um, you know, just send some feedback. Okay, so, uh, all right, okay. So, so here I am. Um, I'm, I'm right now uh, uh, on the East Coast uh, in New Rochelle, New York. Um, so I'm going to uh, present today uh, my experience designing uh, virtual learning environments, especially for training. Um, in um, uh, an experience that spans quite, you know, quite a few years. I've started around 2005, 2006 in Second Life, um, and now I'm I'm actually, you know, I've moved to OpenSim. I've moved to OpenSIM uh, the last year, and uh, so the the transition has been uh, has been interesting. So I'm I'm happy to hear you know my to, to share my my journey and uh, and uh, with you. And uh, I'm aware that a lot of you are already um, probably on the same path, and you're you yourself involved in developing. Uh, virtual environments for both uh, platforms. Okay. All right. So, so one one of the things that uh, I wanted to to say is that about the title is that when when I'm speaking about virtual exercise design, at the start I thought I would it should be actually for immersive um, virtual learning environments. Um, and then I realized that most of the time I spend designing virtual environments for learning, it's actually in situ. And I spend most of the time interacting with my audience, with my clients, uh, within the virtual world itself, which is, which is kind of interesting. It's not typical. Um, we, have, we have minimal face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, we do have face-to-face -face interaction, but that's almost like 10, 20% of the time. So, let me try to move here to the next slide. So, what I was trying to do is to talk about, uh, you know, the various challenges that I faced, you know, on the operational, technical, usability, and learning and evaluation levels so that, um, you know, perhaps it won't be as well structured as one, two, three, four, the list here, but, but, but most of the information is in there, and I'm going to try to to focus on each and every one of them and try to provide um, um, actionable um, pieces of, of of advice that that I thought I might be able to give, given the amount of time I've spent with uh, you know a target user your users and uh, and uh, and given the range of simulations that I have been involved in developing. Okay. Uh, regarding questions and comments, um, I'm aware you can actually, I, I don't mind if you 
type in your questions as they pop up in your mind. Um, I'll try to focus on, on uh, you know, on uh, the, the the chat here, and I'll try to catch them. Okay. Uh, please don't mind if I miss them. Uh, just keep uh, typing and repeating the the comments if if uh, if I miss any. Okay. So, what is virtual exercise design? Um, I thought I would define this because. Um, you know, sometimes it's not very obvious, given the feedback I've got from uh, a few reviewers, or you know, from some of my uh, federal grant submissions. So, what I mean by by exercise is is precisely this. Okay, there are there are a number of of um, of common aspects of an exercise that we, that I personally view as 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 important. Okay, so let's review those. Um, the, the the first aspect I focused on uh, is broadly speaking, since we are still at the philosophy level here, we are we are talking about you know the demonstration aspect. Um, so when an exercise is being carried out, it allows you know uh, people who are observing the exercise uh, to to get a sense of the various steps or actions that are needed in order to produce a particular outcome. And, uh, and you can also, uh, through observation um, of somebody demonstrating uh, a certain skill, you can also evaluate uh, that skill. Um, the second aspect of an exercise is, is practice. Um, so when you have an exercise, uh, you can actually, you know, one of the of the, of the core elements of an exercise is the, the ability to, to repeat it, um, either to become a better at it or, or whether you want to, to refresh your memory um, before you actually do the actual thing. And, and typically, the practice is done in a safe environment. OK. And the other component um, you look at when you talk about exercise is the collaborative aspect of exercises. Um, so, for example, um, I think before giving out example, let me say this. Uh, the collaborative aspect, it allows the, 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 the students or the, the people involved in exercise to understand the nature of divining and conquering complex operations uh, through team interactions. Okay. So there are some exercises that don't require collaboration, but there are also a, a very large set of exercises that, that require people interacting with each other, dividing this task, and, and actually uh, solving it. And lastly, the last component is the evaluation. It kind of you know, is, 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 is tied up. Uh, a bit obliquely to the first one, which is like when you actually the demonstration part. Um, it enables the you, you to measure the the learning and, and skill acquisition, and, and that's what you want to do. Uh, you want to measure ideally skill transferability from virtual to real. Okay, so let's those, those definitions. Uh, once you know we, we are clear about them. You know, we can start thinking about, okay, what is a virtual exercise design? So what we want to do is we want to take the exercise as it is done in the real world and try to shift it in the virtual world and try to see, um, you know, whether the virtual exercise provides affordances uh, for, the, for the aspects that we identified to be the, the main ones of an exercise. Okay, well, that is philosophy. But at least we are clear about what we are talking about. Okay. So some of the previous projects I've been involved with uh, that involves virtual exercise design is the first one is a pandemic flu influenza uh, emergency preparedness training um, effort uh, that involved you know, a number of universities. Um, so, so here, as you can imagine, there was... Um, a lot of the collaborative aspects of an exercise that came into play. So if you are teaching a start protocol or a triage you know, protocol, 
um, whether it's start or elevated se severity index ESI. Um, this, it's actually a, collabor a deeply collaborative activity uh, or when you want to explain what is span of control and how to assign different roles to different individuals um, and then have unleash all these students in an environment and then have them solve you know, a particular emergency response task. There's a lot of collaboration that, is, that, is, uh, that comes into play in here. So that's just describing you know, the goal of the first project. The second one is a bit more, where, you know, the demonstrative aspect. And there are a number of projects out there where, 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 where you have avatars performing exercises. There are, there are researchers out there who actually have produced uh, you know, results in an oblique way showing that if you have your avatar doing exercises in the real, in the virtual world, gets translated into the real, etc. Um, on my end, I was looking from a different angle. I was trying to look at how to use, you know, the virtual environment to create, to help somebody, um, you know, perform yoga poses uh, in, a, in a very detailed way. And, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit, you know, uh, in further detail. The, f the third one uh, I, was, I was involved is in is uh, a virtual rea reality therapy solution that promotes um, behavior modification in, in individuals with daily living challenges. Uh, many of these individuals have um, you know, social behavioral issues and, uh, and we had to design a virtual environment to teach them some, some basic um, aspects of daily living. Um, so that's another project that I'll touch on. Uh, the last one that I'm currently engaged in is in hazardous materials training. Um, as you can imagine, you, that's kind of related to uh, the emergency response training, and uh, we get a chance to touch on that. But as I said, I won't go into details about what the projects are, but I'll, I'll, I'll really pinpoint on some design guidelines that I learned so that you can actually take those and, and inform your own efforts. And it's just an opinion. You might think that you know, those are not, that's not the right way to, to go about doing things. OK, so the first kind of exercises I'm talking about is the, the very simple kind, where you have somebody actually doing a physical exercise. So yoga is, is done in the real world. You, know, you have a series of poses, and there's a lot of attention that is placed on breathing. And, uh, and, and you need to be able to understand the two in order to get the benefits of the exercise. Okay? So in this case, what I tried to do is that I spent a lot of time trying to animate uh, an avatar. But at the same time, what I did was I tried to represent uh, or allow um, users to see things that they cannot visualize in the real world. For example, when you have an instructor teaching you about a vinyasa, which is like a flow uh, between um, you know, various poses, there are changes in, in the breath pattern. Okay? It's not easy for somebody doing an exercise and at the same time say, okay, now I'm breathing in through this particular pose and I'm breathing out, I'm exhaling through the other one. And, and it's kind of difficult to do the exercise and through speech and breathe the right way and teach your student. So every time when I deal about you know, trying to, to implement something in the virtual, there's something clicking in my mind. What can I do in the virtual that cannot be done in the real? To me, that's the key. You know, I, I don't want to, to first around, okay, you know, uh, a lot of ancillary reasons why we should do it in virtual. Let's, let's look for a, for a very hard-hitting goal. So in this case, you have, you have the, the person doing you know, um, some, some stretches in the sitting position, and then you're doing a downward dog. And at the same time, you know, you get to see the scroll, the, the kind of progress bar above the head and, and the circle that's above the head that gives you 
some information about how much inhalation has occurred and how much exhalation is, is happening throughout the animation. So just an example highlighting the demonstrative aspect of a physical exercise. Okay, so um, the, 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 and uh, let me move on to the next uh, example here. Um, oh, wow, well, that slide came in fast. All right, so um, the, the reason why um, I, I talked about the previous example is to, to try to, to touch, you know, like a bee over, you know, just trying to, to fly over a few flowers and show you, you know, various aspects of exercises. And one of them was, was the yoga one because I felt it was the best example to, to illustrate demonstration of something in the real that you can enhance in the virtual. You would actually choose something like trying to assemble an engine or, or, or dismantle a computer and show the just parts, etc. But that's the example I choose because you know, I was involved in that kind of project. You know, very quickly here for this slide where I was planning to talk about you know, issues I, I faced when migrating from OpenSIM to, uh, from Single Life to OpenSIM, but I see that most of you are already familiar with these issues. Um, like, like um, just like Kay mentioned before me, um, the transition is is only um, difficult in the beginning, at least for me, when I when uh, I realized that I had to leave around you know more than one hundred fifty thousand dollars of content, uh, which was trapped in in uh, the Second Life platform. So even though you can sell things on the marketplace and all that, uh, when it comes to projects. Um, that are funded federally or by clients, there are a number of things that really uh, cannot be uh, achieved if you're using a Second Life platform. Uh, I, was, I was a bit afraid about the, the technical capabilities of OpenSIM, um, but I'm much less so right now. Um, I also see there are some technical advantages to actually developing OpenSIM, you know, even from the basic user level. Uh, there are a lot more technical advances in the same than in Second Life. That's pretty controversial thing I'm seeing here. But when I realize, for example, that um, now I, I cannot do away without non-player characters, and I see um, that was not available in Second Life, for example, that's a big no. The only thing I might be a little worried about is about the physics engine. Um, we have been promised the bullet engine for quite a while. I'm still waiting and hoping that we are going to get a good physics engine. But the core reason why I'm in OpenSIM is because I am in full control of my content. Um, it's, 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 you know, that, that's, the, that's the real reason. And the other reason is that for the client, they don't need to keep paying Second Life just to have their content hosted. And when we talk about content, it's not content in inventories. It's content which is on, you know, deployed on a sim. Two different things, because it takes a lot of efforts to actually take things out of your inventory and assemble um, on, 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 the, on, on, a, on a region or on a sim. Okay, so I'll move very quickly for, <laughs> to the next slide, because uh, I don't spend too much time on the transition. Okay, so now we are coming to things that you can use, and it's kind of controversial, but it's okay. Uh, you know, I don't uh, assume that I that that's the best thing. There are probably many better ways for um, for implementing things. So um, one of the things I've noticed is that even though I use use it myself, is you try to avoid numerical scores to represent progress through an exercise. Instead, strive to represent progress through changes or modifications made to, to the environment as a result of actions performed during the said exercise. So for example, um, I can choose to, uh, to have a, a student solve a certain task and then give you know, like, like, like a number to how fast they completed it. Um, or I can design the environment in such a way so that they are actually assembling uh, 
the, 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 the thing, uh, you can just by looking at the evolving result uh, in order to get a sense of how much progress has been made and, and just by looking at it, you know, because form usually, the form of something gives you a, an idea of the history of various steps that led to that current stage. So there's much more information in, in, in that than just giving a score. Um, if you have, for example, a shoot them up game, usually you have people, you know, the current uh, design principle is that you give the person like a score, a number, but you could also just have corpses lying around and and give an idea of, you know, uh, how much progress you're making in a, in a combat situation. Um, there are also, you know, of course, there are many optimizing technical issues that come in that sometimes pulls um, you away from, 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 from this guideline. Okay. Um, but, we, you know, right now this is what I think um, should be the ideal, and we can try to optimize things if, if we find that technically it's not possible to do so. The second thing um, I realized is that the, the dividing line, that there is a dividing line between the casual users and virtual environment designers. Okay? If you look at the user interface of the viewer, it reflects powerfully the assumption that the need to manipulate a virtual environment is primarily of concern only to the 3D modeler. So what I mean by that is that, you know, if you look at all the tools that are provided in a viewer, uh, most of them are not, you know, that's something obvious that I'm saying, so I apologize. Um, most of users don't actually use them because, you know, they, most of them walk around, touch, and they want to interact with the environment in a way that they do in the real world, okay? Um, so, so the, the, there is the issue of trying to satisfy both both users here. Uh, well, not users. What the the designers, the three designers, and the casual user. This has been debated in lists, you know, for for ages. But I'll give you specific examples that will make this much clearer. Okay. Um, yeah, that's kind of repeating the last one. The 3D modeler-centric view UI is a barrier to target user interaction. Okay. Um, the, the, there are two things that I found to be, at least with my target audience, which are typically non-players, non-computer game players. They have a lot of difficulty with a camera, and the inventory is something that is... Even though it's an obvious thing to have for us as designers, uh, it's one of the, the 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 aspects of the of of interacting in virtual worlds as it is now that is kind of troublesome. And I show how having uh, actions that require the inventory interaction it really hurts flow. Okay, so so one of the guidelines regarding camera control, at least what I do, is whenever possible, I try to 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 create situations where 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 manual camera control is kept to a minimum. Okay, that's kind of difficult to to imagine in a world like Second Life or OpenSim. Um, we can have some automatic camera control if you sit on a chair and have the camera just swings at the, you know, to the right position and orientation. If you're looking at the poster, you have auto zoom, you have all kinds of, of tricks like that. Um, but the broad guideline is uh, I'm trying to, uh, whenever I design, I try to minimize uh, manual camera control. Perhaps this will change when we go and change the user, the, the actual hardware for accessing virtual world because if you're Worrying, you know, the, the HMDs, it's not going to be a problem, I think. Yeah, HMD for head mounted displays. Uh, or, you know, with head tracking and all, just like the Oculus Rift. All right, the, the, the other thing about inventory manipulation that I just mentioned is, you know, it, sh it should be kept to, to a minimum because of the propensity to dampen emotion and flow. 
and I'll show you an example where I'm just hoping I get the picture. All right. So here's a picture. Initially, when I was working in Second Life, I would spend a lot of time teaching people how to interact with the inventory. You can imagine somebody goes into a virtual environment and then they spend a lot of time um, um, learning about the inventory and camera controls and chatting, walking, without having done a single thing for the very first training session. And this is deeply discouraging. And, and most of the time, you know, with people with narrow attention span, both in space and time, it becomes, it's not easy to, to actually keep people interested. Whereas in OpenSea, one of the things you can do, for example, uh, is that you can uh, have these, um, you know, forced attachment of, <laughs> of, uh, of objects. So, so in, in this case, for example, you can see the lower picture. If somebody wants to wear all the, all the personal uh, protection gear for a firefighter, you just, they can actually just walk up to a non-player character displaying all the things that you need and, and click and get all, all, all your gear up. Okay, the same things for all the other uniforms. So I am bypassing the inventory. The only problem with this is that, of course, the attachment objects get stacked up in your inventory. Okay, um, so inventory management is becomes an issue. All right. So if you start with the goal that you need to have, um, you know, um, an easier way for people to wear things, that leads immediately to new ways of dealing with attachments. And, and, and whether they need to be stacking up and thousands of copies made and, and fill your inventory. This is, to me, it's obvious that that's not the way for doing things because let's, at least we, I am clear about that. Okay, the next uh, slide is, um, I'm just showing here, for example, a user, uh, instead of at a click getting all the gear, you want them to know where they can actually access, access these various pieces of equipment um, in, in the real world. So you have a fire truck here, and then it has all these different compartments. And, uh, and the, 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 the user has to walk towards the, the fire truck, open up the various uh, compartments as needed, and pick the items. And as soon as just a single click, you know, they would just wear the right thing here. The person is wearing a hat. You know, they could wear the SCBA or, you know, they could even pull out a, a fire line, a, a hose, a, a hose line, and, um, and things like that. But really, you want all actions to bypass the inventory. The inventory really destroys flow. Um, I cannot stress that more. And I think that has a lot of implications regarding you know, how we should move forward when, when we think of improving the viewer or even the underlying infrastructure of OpenSIM. Okay, so as I said, direct manipulation, that is our, our urge to change the environment, that's different from, from a user, and it's, it's not the same as somebody, you know, pulling, pushing prints and, and importing mesh objects and adjusting and all that. Two different classes of things. We cannot assume that those two things are going to, uh, can be satisfied by a single set of tools. Okay, we, we should actually script direct manipulation, either at the scripting level, or if we find that some of those direct manipulations that are useful for end users, we can try to take those and inject it back so that you know, people who, are, who do the, the 3D modeling can also benefit for, from those kind of uh, advances made for direct manipulation for the users. I'll give you a few examples, don't worry. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. Okay, that's a good example. So while, while it is trivial for a 3D modeler, for example, to pick an apple and put it on a table, right, through editor tools, okay, this task is a frustrating one for a casual user. So let's say I walk in a virtual world, I see an apple in a basket, I want to put it on a table. I am not a 3D modeler, I would wonder how the hell do I do that? Is it stuck on the table, I mean in the basket? You know, it, it's kind of. 
So we are really moving from the traditional view of games. Uh, could somebody uh, let me know how much time is left? Yeah, it's one four. Um, started at twelve thirty. Wow. Okay. So you know that's a difficult task and um, for the users. So how how do I make it simple for a user? Next slide. Okay, I've talked about you know how I um, you know I'm providing a solution through scripting. So given two objects, how can what is the most simple way we can um, we can uh, um, we can select so that you know to, to facilitate this task? Okay. Ah, okay. Well, it's just because I feel that, that what I'm speaking is much more um, fluid and uh, I might have, uh, um, you know, uh, repeated myself through, through the slides by, by becoming more, you know, by explicitly writing what I was trying to say. So, so I'm sorry for flipping the slides too quickly. All right. Right. So... Um, So I think what what I was trying to say here is that um, when I was trying to to solve the simple problem of selecting uh, an apple and moving it and placing it on a table, I came up with a number of solutions, and each of them had a problem. Okay, until I landed on a solution that that doesn't seem to be quite intu intuitive. Okay, so this is what I did next. So if you can zoom on, on the picture uh, on this table, okay, I was trying to have a setup where a user who is trying to learn about meal planning, they had to, to pick um, um, objects from, from, from a basket, you know, and utensils and lay a table, and they had to do it very, in, in a direct way without having to go through the inventory. Okay, so first, the first problem is how do you select an object? Okay, so you can select an object. In this case, I had to have big handles on each and every object so that when you click on the handle, it tells you which objects is selected. But you can see that visually this is not appealing. There's, you know, the handles, it's difficult to design. It forces people to have to learn camera orientations so that they get to get, they can actually see the handles so that they get to click on. Okay, so uh, very quickly I moved away from this approach. And uh, I landed, landed upon some other solution, which I call temporal grasping, which, uh, which is slightly different in the sense that the, an object is, is selected only when, when you keep uh, left clicking that is touching it for a minimum amount of time. Okay, so if I have an object like an apple and a plate, and I have to, to put the apple on the plate, okay, I press left click on the apple for a, for a minimal duration, okay, uh, not for a minimal, sorry, for more than one second, and then it gets selected, and then I click on the plate, and the apple gets placed on the plate. It's kind of, a, of something, it's like I said, it's a very simple problem, but the, the, the solution didn't, it's not too intuitive. But when I, when I experimented with this approach, I found out that it's actually quite workable. So in this case, you don't need to fiddle with your camera position in order to find a handle on the object and click on that handle and tell the system that the object is being selected the appropriate object, and then click on the other object and say that, okay, now I'm going to, uh, so that the, the, the system knows that the, the other point is actually the target position. And then that's how the system knows that the, the apple needs to go on, on the plate, you know, and you don't need any extra handle. And when you look at the environment, it looks, you know, 
pretty much the same as any 3D environment. So for example, in this case, I could make it easier for somebody to create, to make a sandwich, okay? It's not one of the best things you want to do in a virtual world, but if you're explaining things about you know, meal planning, for example, you have the user go there, you have a number of, of food items on the table, and just by you know, clicking on, on the objects, various objects, and, and, and they can put it on the plate, okay? Um, all right. So all the objects in this environment are targets, okay? All, all the, they, they, they are not specific targets. The, the environment is fully um, graspable in the sense that if I see a bottle, I just flick the bottle, I can put it on the table, I can put it on, on, on the refrigerator. It's like every object has got scripts that enables them to become a possible target. Okay, so, 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 so as a design guideline, you don't want to, to add too many um, notifications in your environment. It makes things really ugly and noisy, uh, and you want to avoid that. You want things to, to look um, as, as, um, as far as possible the way they would look without any, you know, uh, any additional information overlaid on them, okay? So that, that's my design goal. It's a hard one, but once you find a solution, you'll find that that really improves um, your interactivity a lot. Okay, next slide. So again, the same principle here, I'm using it to demonstrate how you can use the, the same uh, um, approach to allow users to create content. You know, in this case, it's, it's not exactly Lego. It's a bit more than Lego in the sense that you, you're, you're, you're picking, um, you know, in one of these objects and you're assembling them together, okay? So for example, if you want to put a flower on a stem, you select the flower, you know, spend, you know, Um, more than one second left clicking on it gets selected and then just touch release on where you want it to go and it's going to go there automatically and it's going to be oriented automatically. You know, basically what I'm doing is that the normal of that object just, um, you know, gets um, aligned with the normal at the point of the target. Simple things like that has tremendous impact on direct manipulation by the users, they don't even need to know how things are working. What they, what they see is that, hey, I have two objects here, I want to put one on top of the other, I'm selecting one and putting it on, on, on the other just in a... ...an intuitive way, and I didn't need to do any extra manipulations. You know, with the same basic infrastructure, you can just build, you know, like, like a board game very easily without, uh, you know, any extra work. And you can actually just, you know, users move pieces around just like, like they would do in the real world. Uh, select a piece and click somewhere else, that piece is going to go there. Um, so when, when you're faced with this kind of direct manipulation, then you start thinking, you know, is this not something that needs to be um, a feature of the viewer from ground up rather than have all these different things implemented in script? When you implement things in script, you're actually wasting a lot of resources. And there are also many other constraints, okay? Uh, the number of listeners, for example, is limited, and you really need to optimize your code a lot in order to um, to make those interactions possible in order to have a large number of objects that would have the same kind of property in the environment. Okay, so 
as I said, uh, there there are there are technical constraints that 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 hurt usability, um, but uh, you know at least we should have our design guidelines clear, and then we try to optimize. And, 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 and try to work around if possible. Okay. And, uh, and as you can see right now, how different our class of virtual environments is, is from the typical games that are out there. You know, you don't, in, a, in a typical blockbuster, The game, you have a very narrow set of of interactions, whereas 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 on the whereas in uh, in OpenSim or Second Life, you have a lot of opportunities to um, to have much finer interactions. But we do need to spend some time in order to um, to facilitate um, those interactions. Okay. All right, so um, I think I'm coming close to my my last few slides here um, on the evaluation aspects. Okay, so um, my kind of evaluation is is directly, you know, rooted in in in, in the following principle. I actually create an evaluation exercise to help me. Um, to help me find out what I was already trying to achieve. Um, my evaluation exercises, at least the way I did design them, is not to throw my original goal out, you know, just because, um, you know, the, the results tell me so. For example, I wouldn't be, I, I won't find an evaluation exercise that's going to evaluate face-to-face -face versus virtual, and look at the results and say, well, you know, um, face to face um, is better, and therefore I'm going to throw virtual solutions out of the window. No, I believe in the virtual solution, and I'm going to try to construct evaluations that that allows me to improve it. So a lot of my my evaluations are directly um, focused on on the nitty gritty of of the human computer interface interactions in the virtual world. And this has allowed me, for example, um, to know that having interactions through the inventory, for example, is maybe 100, 200 times um, worse than just having interactions straight away um, uh, inside the virtual environment in situ. Okay. So, so those are the my my idea about evaluations. Uh, of course, then you have other levels of evaluation where you want to evaluate learning, and you can bring in the the educational technology folks, and they'll be looking at you know the Bloom taxonomy framework and all these various um, you know things that look at complicated for me. Um, and then you can try to evaluate at a at a different level whether you know students have learned anything or whether um, the things that they have learned in the virtual environment can be translated into the, the, the real world. Um, it's 1.17. I've started at 12.30. So I think I, I, sh I should be stopping here. I'm going to try to uh, answer your questions. If there's any. Okay, I'm going to scroll through the chat here and see some of your questions. This is, uh, we're getting ready to close here, so if anybody has any last questions, please ask them now.
Thanks, Professor Chatterbox. Well, well, none of this work was grant funded, unfortunately. Um, I have moved uh, from a university position, and I'm now 100% um, growing my my personal company. And a lot of this work is coming from from you know the funding from private clients. Ramesh, do you have any last comments? Well, um, what I think, um, well, my last comment was that last year I was a bit worried about, you know, shifting to Second Life, but now I've shift, oh, I've not shifted to OpenSIM, but now I feel fairly comfortable and uh, uh, with, the, with the OpenSIM environment, and um, I think I'm here to stay. Um, and I probably will have a major product release soon. Uh, so, uh, so you know, I hope to be to be back with some more new stuff uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh, for a terrific presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. In this room, the next session will be the fantastic voyage of converting to open sim for biology and archaeology education at 1230. Thank you again to our speaker and the audience. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate your patience. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.